All right, this is uh, part two of our program. Again, air to air heat pumps. Now we're going to talk about airflow. Again, our purpose is to get you through this air to air heat pump exam. It is progressive. So hopefully you didn't start here. You started to part one. If you go on and something seems a little vague or unfamiliar or I'm referring to something you don't understand, it's probably because it's in a previous section. Pocket calculator, always a good tool to have around. The user of this program assumes all liabilities. Again, we can't be concerned. We can't possibly control your perception of what's being said here, nor your application of that. Airflow. Talk about the basics. There's three things we have to be concerned with in airflow. One is volume, the other is velocity, and the other is pressure. And as a rule, they all fall. They all drop the further away you get from the blower in the direction of airflow for different reasons. So let's talk about volume first. Volume is what it says it is. It's cubic feet. It's a, a we measure it in cubic feet. It's the 12 inch by 12 inch by 12 inch cubic foot of air. That's what we're talking about. Now we, we were saying how many of these cubic feet do we circulate every minute? Well, one cubic foot of air weighs, that cubic foot of air weighs 0 0.075 pounds. And it takes 13.33 of those to make one pound of air. 13.33 cubic feet is about a phone booth without Superman has two pounds of air in it. It's about 27, 28 cubic feet of air. Now, why is a pound of air important? Well, because we have to deal with the specific heat of this air if we're going to change its temperature and know what it weighs and all that. So the specific heat of a substance is the heat necessary to raise the temperature of one pound of a substance one degree Fahrenheit. So it takes a quarter of a BTU to raise the temperature of air one degree Fahrenheit. You know the specific heat of water to be one, the number one, because it's the definition of a BTU. It's the heat necessary to raise one pound of water one degree Fahrenheit at temperatures near freezing at sea level. Air is a whole lot more efficient. It only takes a quarter of a BTU to change half a phone booth's worth of air one degree Fahrenheit. So if we multiply the specific heat of air times the weight of a cubic foot times 60 minutes in an hour, we get this number 1.08. Now we can employ what they call the sensible heat calculation. If we want to know how many CFM we're handling, how many cubic feet of air per minute we're handling, we take the sensible BTU output of the furnace, gas furnace, oil furnace, electric heater, whatever it is, and we divide that output in BTUs by 1.08 times the difference in temperature, which is, you know, whatever the temperature is outside relative to what temperature you want to maintain inside. Truly, to be correct with this, you would multiply the temperature difference will be the difference between the temperature in the duct, the air in the duct, and the air in the room that you're supplying it to. Very often they work out to be sim similar. The sensible heat equation, this equation here, or the temperature rise method of determining volume, cannot be used for cooling nor for any compression cycle heating air volume calculation. Only because we need to separate sensible heat from latent heat. And when we have a, an air conditioning unit, it is removing sensible and latent heat. And it would be almost impossible in the field to know what portion of that was sensible and what portion was latent, even if you knew the sensible heat ratio, because that only applies when it's at steady state, and you won't know when this is at steady state. In other words, if a three-ton unit is three tons, but when is it three ton, on a 95-degree day or on an 80-degree day when it's been running for five minutes? or a 95 degree day when it's been running for an hour without shutting off. At what point do you have 36,000 nominal BTU? And of that, how much is sensible and how much is latent heat? So you can't apply this anytime you're dealing with vapor compression. Either heat pumps, 
in the air conditioning season or regular straight up condensing units in the, in the cooling season. Example, let's take a 110,000 BTU output gas furnace that has a supply air temperature of 120 degrees Fahrenheit and a return air temperature of 68 degrees Fahrenheit. What is the volume of air leaving the furnace? Employ the, employ the formula, 110,000 BTU output, and because it's heat and it's fossil fuel heat, it's all sensible. So 110,000 divided by 1.08 times, it's our standard, uh, our constant, times the difference in temperature. This bottom line here is going to become 56. Divide that into 110,000, you're handling 1,964 CFM of air. So you can do this on any furnace you're on tomorrow. Start it up. Let it get up to steady state. Let it run for about 10 or 15 minutes. Measure the temperature difference across the furnace. Look at the label of the furnace. If it's a new furnace, you can pretty much trust the output. Divide that label output by 1.08 times that difference in temperature, and that's what you'll get. Example, an electric furnace that has a supply air temperature of 100 degrees and a return air temperature of 65. The volume of air leaving the furnace is known to be 1150. Maybe you used a flow hood or a magna helic and went to a table and found out what the CFM is. So we know the CFM to be 1150. What's the heating capacity of the furnace in kilowatts? All right, this is an electric furnace. How many kW are kicked in? I can tell that with a temperature measurement and having the blower performance chart. So I know how many CFM I'm handling. You're going to take this formula and turn it around algebraically so that the sensible BTU output we're solving for is equal to the CFM times the temperature difference times 1.08. 1150 CFM times the difference in temperature times 1.08 is 43,470 BTU sensible output. How many watts in a kilowatt? How many BTUs in a kilowatt? Take the 4370, divide it by 4,313, the number of BTUs in a kilowatt, and you'll see that there's 10 kW pulled in, or very close to that. Velocity. How fast does the air move? We measure this in feet per minute. Okay? FPM, feet per minute. Uh, we have a couple formulas we can employ. If we, if we know the CFM like we did in the last case, we can divide this square foot of, square foot, this must be, of area of the duct, the outlet, whatever it is, into the CFM, and we'll get the velocity. If we know the area and the velocity, we can multiply them by each other and get the CFM of air. The area, this capital A, must always be stated in square feet. Okay, so if you have a 24 by 8 duct, you know, that's 24 times 8. Here we go. 24 times 8 divided by 144. 24 by 8 times 8 is the square inches of duct. Like if you have a 10 by 6 register, 10 times 6 is 60. But you have to, that's square inches. You have to divide it by 12 times 12. There's 12 square inches and a 12, uh, 144 square inches in a square foot. 12 times 12. You divide it by 144 and you'll get the square feet. You multiply that by the velocity you read and you get the CFM because that's what we are solving for. CFM is equal to the area in square feet times the velocity. Velocity limits on duct work, the trunk ducts, the main usually rectangular trunk ducts, round, whatever, if you keep the velocity between 700 and 900 feet a minute, you'll have a good system. 700 feet will give you decent projection out of the registers into the room, out of, out of the trunks into the branches, and 900 feet a minute, if you go above that, you're going to start to get noise in the system from moving the air. And the branch ducts, you keep it between 400 and 600 feet a minute. 
400 feet per minute, if the velocity drops below that at the branches, you won't feel the air coming out of the register to any great extent. If you go above 600 feet a minute, you're going to have noise. You're going to hear it, whatever, at the register or grill or whatever. So volume, velocity, pressure. We measure the pressure in inches of water column. One pound per square inch pressure is equal to 27.72 inches of water. Static pressure, it's bursting pressure. It lacks movement. There's another pressure called velocity pressure. It's, it is movement. It's dynamic pressure. It implies movement. Total pressure is the third pressure, is static pressure plus velocity pressure. It's these two together. Now blow up a balloon and hold on to it. What you have inside of that balloon is pure static pressure. As soon as you let go of that balloon, that static pressure immediately be begins to convert to velocity pressure. Because you know when you let go of that balloon, it's going to take off. And the static pressure built up inside that balloon is going to convert to velocity pressure until there's no more pressure inside that balloon. And the pressure inside the balloon and outside the balloon are the same, and the balloon will fall to the floor. All right, so our total pressure went to zero. Now, here's that relationship again. If I take a one square inch glass tube, and at the bottom of that I attach a pressure gauge, and I take a ruler out of my drawer and I lay it up alongside the gauge. If I fill that tube up to a point, a height of 27.72 inches of water, or 2.31 feet, I will see a pressure of one pound per square inch. One pound per square inch is, is per square inch is equal to 27.72 inches of water. Now, if I continue to fill that tube, if I double the height, I will double the pressure at the base. Now, what we're talking about, systems we deal with, we deal with about half an inch to an inch of water column in residential light -like commercial work. Right? Very seldom do we go much above an inch. So of this pound of pressure, we're dealing in one twenty one. 27th of a pound. All right? It's a very slight pressure. This is feet of head. If you're a plumber and you're buying a pump, or a, a hydronic man and you're buying a pump, and you want a 4.62 foot head pump, what you're saying is, I want this pump down here to be capable of pushing a column of water up 4.62 feet. Now at the top of that meniscus, at the top of that water, I'm not going to have any pressure left. But that's okay. My pump can pump it up 4.62 feet. And then if I need more pressure to push it further down the line and back down again, then I add that to the head of my pump. But understand that head, inches of water, feet of head, inches of water column, pounds per square inch are all representations of pressure. Air pressure. If I Take a manometer, and this essentially is representing a, a, a fluid manometer, just a U-tube, all right, and I fill it up, and then I take the end of it, and I put it perfect, perfectly perpendicular to the airstream. I will read purely bursting static pressure that exists everywhere in this duct at all points. Not necessarily always the same pressure, but it's a static pressure that exists at any point, any any edge of that material, that duct material. If I want to know what, what the velocity pressure alone is, I, I, there's a couple things I can do. One thing is I can take a tube and put it in facing the velocity pressure. Because when I do that, this tube, the pressure that this, this tube exerts on this column of fluid will equal both the velocity pressure, the speed that the air is moving, and the static pressure, because the static pressure exists everywhere. And then if I put another probe here, uh, you know, actually just like this, absolutely perpendicular, it will read only static pressure, which will offset the static plus velocity. So static minus static cancel each other out. 
and all I'm left with is the actual velocity pressure if I wanted to read that alone. That's how I have to do it. If I want to know total pressure, I only need one tube. And all I do is put it in facing the direction of airflow, and it will read both velocity and static. And there's no static here to cancel it out, so it's a single tube measurement. That's the way that's done in the real world. Now, this can be an incline manometer. It can be whatever device, magnahelic, whatever it is you're using. Let's talk about fan loss. A fan is actually an air pump. It's an air pump because, remember, air and liquids are all considered fluids. As such, the theoretical performance of a fan follows certain basic laws of physics. And the first one is airflow rate, CFM, varies directly with the fan blade speed, the RPM. So if, for example, the fan speed is doubled, the amount of air moved delivered is doubled. If you have it, the amount of air moved halves. Static pressure capability varies as the square of the fan speed. So it means this, if you double the fan speed, you, you square, if you double it, 2 times 2 is 4, you, you square the resistance that now this fan has to overcome because of the static pressure, the, the velocity pressure, the static pressure that's going to be gained as a result of that. And if you have it, you, you know, it goes down by a quarter. Half times a half is a quarter. That's the square of a half. This is the limiting factor. Horsepower, brake horsepower, required varies as the cube of the fan speed. So the bottom line is this. If you're going to double the fan speed, you're going to need eight times more horsepower than you needed originally. This is one of the reasons why people say the fan laws don't work is because they go in the field and they try to double the fan speed and they don't realize that when they did that they squared the resistance against which the fan can operate which probably put them off the blower performance chart for that fan to begin with not only that but now to actually double the fan speed they need eight times more horsepower than they had before it cubes two times two is four times two is eight so we just don't have motors in the real world of HVAC that can give you that. It's simply not possible. And conversely, you know, it goes the other way as well. You can be down to an eighth of the horsepower requirement if you have the fan speed. So when you go in the field and you say, oh, I'll just double the fan speed, rats a ruck, Charlie. You're probably not going to have the ability to do that. Okay? Centrifugal blowers. Centrifugal blowers are what they mean. They're centrifugal by nature. They pull the air in the center port and they distribute it radially. And it's the centrifugal force of the air created by the movement of the blade on the air, I should say, that causes that comes in here, goes out there, 90 degree angle flow. You have backward curved blades. The direction of curve, uh, the direction of rotation is this way but the blades are curved backwards. There's some advantages to this, you know, not overloading, that kind of thing. You have what they call radial, where, again, the rotation is this way, but the, the blades radiate out from the center like rays from the sun. Forward curved is probably the most common in residential light commercial HVAC. The blades are cupped forward, and you actually, as the fan rotates, you grab the air and you cup it and you enter it here and it has a cutoff that prevents it from recirculating and that gets it out of the volute. That's a centrifugal forward curved blade most commonly used. That's the kind of question you're going to get on the test. What if you have a direct drive blower wheel where the wheel is attached directly to the shaft of the motor that's driving and it's damaged or dirty like this thing is? It's going to result first of all in imbalance. You know, maybe you threw one of the weights that are around here and the thing is wobbly now. What you're going to get is inadequate airflow. You're going to get premature blower motor failure because the gyrations that this wheel is making is attached to the shaft, and that shaft is, in most cases, just a sleeve bearing protected, 
and you're going to wreck that bearing. You're going to wobble that, that uh, shaft and bearing right out of uh, use. And you're gonna, certainly going to get noise. The more violent this uh, disruption is, the more noise you're going to get, the less airflow you're going to get, and the more quickly the motor is going to fail. Register. Limit the face velocity measured right at the face of the outlet. Measure that velocity. Keep it within five to 700 feet a minute. I think that's a little high, but that's okay. And you'll, you'll have good airflow. You'll have good projection into the room that these are the velocities these registers are designed to handle. You'll have good projection, and you won't have noise. Grill, keep it down to 400 feet a minute. The entering air should not enter at this face at a speed greater than 400 feet per minute. If it does, you're going to have noise. Excess velocity will create cold air drafts, uh, complaints during the heating season. Again, you're 98.6, blow on your hand, you're going to feel chill. That's that's the movement of air. It's 98.6 degree air blowing on your 82, 85 degree skin. It feels cold. It's not cold. It's 98.6, but it feels cold because of the velocity, the high velocity associated with it. So when you get complaints, especially in heat pumps, about uh, cold air drafts, go see where the people are sitting when they're complaining about that draft. And I guarantee you, most times you're going to see them sitting right in front of a grill or uh, underneath a ceiling outlet or something like that, and they're going to say, well, I sit here because eventually it gets really cold, or I'm sorry, really warm, or it gets really cold in the summer, or whatever the case is. Sometimes they just don't know any better and just have them move their chair or, you know, put some kind of deflector on this that will deflect the air to a more suitable place. But don't blow air on people. Supporting flexible duct. What do you what do you got to do? Well, if the duck is eight inches or less, you need to support it every five feet. You need to know that every five feet, and you're not supposed to have more than a half inch of sag. The sag, if this were a straight line, at any point between that five foot to five foot, should not be more than half an inch. The minimum width of any saddle or strap that you're going to wrap around a piece of flex duck should be at least inch and a half. At least inch and a half. If it's thinner than that, it has the possibility of cutting into the insulation material and, and you know, hurting the duck, losing the insulation material. Flexible duck, of course, has considerably less airflow than plain round duck. You can't take the average duck calculator and use it to size flexible duck, pick a flexible duck size. You can't do it, all right, because it's not going to give you the right size. Flexible duck, because of the corrugation, has an extremely high resistance to airflow. In fact, ASHRAE funded a five-year study, a four- or five-year study at Texas A&M, and they found out absolutely earth-shattering information about poorly installed flex duct. And don't get me wrong, flex duct is a wonderful labor-saving product, but it's very much abused in our industry. And if it's abused, it's not going to perform the way the manufacturer designed it to. This is a uh, nice duct system here. Let's talk about it a little bit. First of all, how do you know if that's the correct size? Well, you can never know just by glancing at a picture like this. Uh, no one can do that. But an undersized duct system, okay, and that could be the trunks are too small, the branches are too small, or both. might be just the returns too small. You choke off the return, you choke off your supply. So a duct distribution system that's undersized will create inadequate heating and cooling, Less airflow, less BTUs go along for the ride. High external static pressure because of the resistance now that that blower has to overcome. It's greater than what it, if you will, thought it was going to have to overcome to deliver the same volume of air. And you're going to get noise because of that. None of these things are good things to have. 
Isolation collars are added, and this is what uh, most of us probably call JGL Junior if you buy Duradyne's product. It's a duck, a duck insulation. And you buy this in 50-foot, 100-foot rolls, and you cut off what you need and form it. And basically, it's a flexible material. It can be canvas. In the old days, it used to be um, uh, fireproof uh, asbestos, okay, asbestos cloth. You know, there's still a lot of this out there. But it isolates the vibration from the blower from the uh, ducts, the hard ducts that are tied to the structural member. So if you stop the vibration, you stop noise because noise transmits via vibration. So that collar reduces the vibration and therefore the noise transmission of the blower into the structure that these ducts are all attached to. Ductwork installed in an unconditioned space, attic, crawl space, whatever, should be insulated and protected with a vapor barrier. It should be wrapped or lined, however you're going to do it, but then you need a vapor barrier. Now, if you line the duct, the vapor barrier, if your ducts are sealed, becomes the metal, the sheet metal. If you wrap the duct, the duct has an, uh, typically an FSK foil scrimp back on it, that acts as a vapor barrier. It stops the transmission of vapor. All right, it doesn't stop it, but it slows it down to the point where the permeation is almost nothing. During a preventative maintenance call, a PM call, all ducts should be checked for leaks, separations, and damage. And I don't mean you have to go around if it's in an attic, a dark attic with a flashlight, and look at every joint. You don't. What I do, if I'm in an attic, attics, I've never been in an attic that wasn't, didn't have... 200 pounds of dust in it. Start up the blower while you're there and look around. If there's a bad leak somewhere, you'll see a cloud of smoke and usually a hardy high-O silver as the air leaks out of that point and disturbs the dust that's in the attic. That's the fastest way to do it. But eyeball it, especially if you're in a basement. You have the grand opportunity here. And if all the ductwork is exposed in the basement, like it very often is, uh, you can walk up and down the basement very quickly and while the blower is running and just look for noises, air leaks, obvious openings. You can't be, you don't want to be resealing all the ducts because that's not your job. You're there for a preventative maintenance. What you need to know is that the ducts are all connected. That should be part of your preventative maintenance. Cross break. Why do you use a, a break? To, why do you cross break the metal? What's the point of that? Well, it improves the strength, rigidity, and reduces vibration without additional weight of other materials. This can be, uh, depending on how wide this is, this can be pretty flimsy. So can this pan. But if you break it, you actually increase the rigidity of that. Improves strength and rigidity and reduces vibration without additional weight of other materials. If the duct is already installed and the guy didn't break it or didn't break it properly or at all, then what you can do is take strips of metal and run them from point A to point B. What you would take would be um, drive material or even slip material, but that may be a little more rigid than you need. And But, you know, some kind of at least folded up strips of 30-gauge, 28-gauge metal and run maybe one inch wide strips from here to here and then drill screw them to the duct. That'll improve the rigidity. If the duct is oil canning, which happens when the blower starts up and the duct expands and you get that oink oink noise of the metal cracking and sounds like it's breaking, that's oil canning. And then when the blower shuts off, uh, the, it, it recompresses, all right, and you get another noise. Then when the ducts get hot, they expand and start to buckle and make noise again. That's all considered oil canning, and cross-breaking will, will avoid that to a, to a very high degree. You'll get little or no oil canning. You know what an oil can is? An oil can where you, looks like a uh, pressure bell, and out of the top of the bell comes a, uh, a nozzle, and you turn the thing over, it, it's filled with oil, and you... You press the bottom of it with your thumb, and it makes an oil canning sound. That's what I'm talking about. Definitions. Infiltration is, keyword, uncontrolled outdoor air 
leakage into a conditioned space through cracks, openings in the exposed surfaces, leakage through an attic ceiling, leakage, uh, leaky crawl space, a leaky basement, wherever. Infiltration can be caused by a collection of pressure drivers, such as wind, the stack effect, the height of the building, vents, chimneys that are open, exhaust fans, and duct leakage can cause infiltration. It's the uncontrolled leakage of outside air into a building. Ventilation is the controlled, engineered movement of air from the outdoors through the conditioned space to the outdoors again. We typically, excuse me, bring ventilation in to resolve problems we have with lack of uh, combustion air, that kind of thing. The flow of air may, may exit through cracks and penetrations in the thermal envelope, the outside of the building, relief openings, ancillary exhaust systems, dedicated exhaust systems, heat recovery equipment, chimneys or vents. We don't care how it gets out. We're bringing it in under a controlled fashion to satisfy a need, and then we're going to get rid of it. Maybe we need uh, 20 CFM per person, and the house is so tight we don't have it. We might use an ERV an energy recovery ventilator to do that. We might use an HRV, a heat recovery ventilator, to do that. There's a lot of ways to do it in residences. But this is mostly, not exclusively, but mostly a commercial concern, not residential. Unless it's a real tight house, then it is a residential concern. Exfiltration is the uncontrolled flow of air moving from the conditioned space to the outdoors through holes, cracks, whatever. Uncontrolled. Exfiltration is the reverse of infiltration. You use exfiltration if you have a pressurized building in a residence commercial, you're exfiltrating a lot of air that you're bringing in. If you are in a commercial application, you may want to create the exfiltration effect. You may use your the addition of outside air through an economizer on your supply side that your, your system that feeds the uh, dining room of your restaurant and you create a positive pressure in there because you're supplying more air than you're returning. Now the air, the positive pressure in there exfiltrates into the kitchen and into the bathroom and uh, the bathroom fans and the kitchen fans exfiltrate that air out even further under pressure. So that exfiltration into the kitchen and bathroom keeps those odors from coming back in to the now positively pressurized dining room. So while you're eating, you don't have to, you're eating a steak, you don't have to listen or smell the fish cooking in the kitchen nor have to deal with bathroom odors. The duct system very often is a big driver of pressure. Ideally, we'd have sealed ducts, both supply and return, when they're located in unconditioned areas, and we would have a neutral pressure in the building. We will return the same amount of air that we supply. If, however, we have this situation where we have a tight return and a leaky supply, we're going to create a negative pressure. How high is that negative pressure going to be? How much air are you losing through the supply side relative to the return side? Now we're supplying less air than we're bringing back. We're supplying less air than we're bringing back. Mother Nature just saw an imbalance, and she rushed to correct it. And how she corrected it was allowing more air from the outside into this negative pressure to e try to equalize that zone, that air zone. The other possibility is you have a leaky return and a and a tight supply. In that case, you create a positive pressure. Now, the good thing about a positive pressure is, because you're, now you're supplying more air than you're returning. So the result is you have a higher pressure inside the building than outside. And Mother Nature goes to work again and tries to equalize that. And she's going to let that higher pressure inside flow to the lower pressure outside. The good thing is, if you have exfiltration or leakage, you don't have infiltration can't go against higher pressure. Bad thing is, where's that air coming from? Well, it's coming from an unconditioned space, so even though it's not coming from outside, it's still outside air because it's unconditioned. It might even be in worse shape than outside air. 
take air from the outside on a 95 degree day or take it from an attic on a 95 degree day and that air is 130 degrees. You see what I'm saying? So no matter the fact that you've stopped your infiltration doesn't save you any money. It, you still have to pay to heat and cool the air that enters this furnace, air handler, whatever, before it's distributed to the house. And that reduces the capacity of your equipment dramatically. A 15% leak rate in the return duct with a, a, a tight supply, 15% of the air coming back is from an unconditioned attic. You cannot, you, your capacity is halved. Your three ton unit is now acting like a ton and a half unit. If you have a 20% leak, you can't satisfy the building at design conditions. When it's 95 outside, 20, you're trying to maintain 75 inside. If you have a 20% leak in a return duct in an attic, you can't satisfy the building. You'll never hit 75 when it's 95 out, even it, assuming the unit was properly sized to begin with. That's how serious duct sealing is today. I didn't know it was coming to this slide. <laughs> Again, return air leaks of 15% in attic reduces the condition capacity by capacity by 50% or more during the peak load condition. 20% adequate, you, it's impossible to satisfy the house. You can't do it. Absolutely impossible. We didn't know this when the last Manual J, for instance, was published and we calculated these loads. We used to think it was pretty much static, that it was never more than a 30, 35 percent, maybe 15 or 20 percent additional load in the summertime. Man, were we misinformed. One of the big differences between Manual J 7th edition and the 8th edition is this new knowledge that we have from all the research and the studies that were done. Let's look at uh, pressures, static pressures. If the, I have this particular coil and my airflow is in this direction, upflow in this case, and I put a manometer, magnahelic, something under here, and I read a pressure of 0.4 inches at the bottom of the entrance of that coil, and above the coil I read 0.2, I have to subtract this from that to show my pressure drop of 0.18. I started out, the blower's right here, I started out at 0.4 and it dropped 2 eighths of an, a 0.28 inches to a value of 0.12 inches of water column. What's that mean? Well, I know I have this particular coil, so if I run across here where it says static pressure, wet and dry, it says that if that coil was wet, and I read a 0.28 pressure drop over it that therefore my CFM was 800. That this pressure drop tells me that 800 cubic feet of air are going across that coil every 60 seconds. That's the information I just got. And you can use this to interpolate a chart like this. That kind of pressure drop is what I want to deal with here because this, the blower we choose for the furnace or the, the blower we choose as an air handler, whatever the case is, has to overcome all the pressures that are external to it. Now those things include supply duct. Supply duct, you guys tell me you design your supply ducts for point one. You don't. You think you do, but you don't. You need to get into a manual, J, a manual D class if you really believe that, because you don't get to assign static pressure. All right? You're not divine. And until you are, you don't get to decide what static pressure is going to be in this duct. That you learn in a manual D class. You tell me your return ducts are 0 0.08, 0 0.10, but we'll accept that for now. That's a good middle number. Hopefully, if you do your calculations right and you choose the right size ducts, you'll end up with these numbers but very often you don't. You can't start there. You, you hope to finish there. The evaporator coil, when it's dry, brand new out of the box, clean, dry, no water on it, has a pressure drop of about 0 0.20, okay, for this particular coil that I chose. The other components, the external components that the blower has to overcome are the air cleaner, 
brand new out of the box, this air cleaner has a pressure drop from here to here of 0.2 inches of water. My registers have a drop of about 0.03, my return grills about 0.03, and my volume dampers wide open have a pressure drop across them in my branch lines, my dampers, and in my trunk lines of about 0.03. So if I add all these resistances, external components up, it adds up to 0.69. So if I need a 3 ton blower, and I'm calling it that nominally, if I need 1,200 cubic feet of air, then I need a blower that can deliver 1,200 cubic feet of air against 0.69 inches of external static pressure. Now, what do I do? How do I pick a blower that way? Very simple. Go over to the blower performance chart. And what you'll see right here is external static pressure in inches of water column. 0.1, 2, 3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7. This chart goes out to 0.8. I want you to notice right here, 0.5. All blowers, whether they're air handlers or furnace blowers, give you the airflow that's stated for the blower only against half-inch water column at high speed. Look at here. This is high speed. Though the speeds go from low to high. Low, medium, low, medium, medium, high, high. Okay, for this particular manufacturer. So if I'm working against half an inch static pressure, this blower it, on low speed is going to give me 540 cubic feet. When I go to the next speed, 725, then it goes to 600. When I'm up to medium high, I can get 1,000 cubic feet of air out of that blower against half an inch static. But the only place I get 1,200 is when I'm on high speed and at half inch. Go over here to the right. I'm still on high speed, but I don't have 1,200 CFN anymore. It dropped off to 1,175 because the external, external static pressure increased to 0 0.6. How about when the external goes to 0.7? I'm down to 1,065. How about when the external static pressure is 0.8? Now I'm down below 1,000, 975. That's not even a good 2.5 ton blower, much less a 3 ton blower. Drop down. What's that? Can't read it. What is the blower that's the best way? Oh, it's, it's 800 CFM. That's why I couldn't see it. And, and that's, eight, that's a 2 ton blower. Here's a 12. That's a, th a 3 ton blower. Drive over here. There it is, 1265. 1195 is awful close to 1200. What's this? 1400 cubic foot blower. Run along here till you'll see 14. Right there, 1360. It dropped off low. That's not a great blower for three and a half ton. You, you, if you're working against 0.5 inch static, you're, you're only getting 1360. It's not the end of the world, but it's not great. 1740. That's a four ton. Okay, that's a good blower. You can get 1600 even against. 0.6 inches of water. 1205, 2 ton again. 1400, where do you see that? Right in here, right in this range. 1493, it's almost, it's high. 1525, that's a good blower. But they're all typically rated high speed, half inch static pressure. Understand that. We need 1200 CFM against 0.7. Remember, 0.69, rounded off to 0.7. So drop down here. Do you find 12, here's 1265. It's on medium speed, and it's a 4-ton blower. A 3-ton blower is only a 3-ton blower against half-inch static pressure when it's on high speed. Okay? Understand that. Manufacturers not guaranteeing you that if you take this furnace and put it in any application that you'll get 1,200 cubic feet of air at. In fact, he stated under which conditions you'll get 1,200 cubic feet. You have to be the professional as an HVAC professional and look and see what the detail is and what that means to your particular circumstance. Duct system types. Let's talk about types of duct systems because you're going to get questions about that on the exam. Extended plenum systems, okay? Look at this box on top of this air handler furnace, and you know 
like I know, that that's a plenum. That's a mixing box. To me, a plenum is a mixing box. Not so in technical literature. All right? If a duck, and this is the description of an extended plenum duck system, it's going to be on a test to some extent. They'll ask you about one of the duck systems we're about to talk about. The way this is done, if this branch line extends out like this and doesn't reduce, it maintains one size and the branch, I'm sorry, the trunk line and the branches come off perpendicular, it's considered to be, this trunk is considered to be an extension of this plenum. That's the way it's looked at. In this case, you you only have one trunk, and because it doesn't reduce or change size and the branches or multiple branches come off of it uh, at different locations, then it is also, this trunk is considered an extension of the plenum, and hence the name extended plenum duct system. Now, this is what they call a reducing extended plenum duct system. You have the extension of the plenum, but now it reduces at some point. And usually that point is the point at which the velocity, the initial velocity halves, and that's when you make the reduction. But don't worry about that. Understand how these systems are built and what these names mean. Flexible duct, we all know and love. Perimeter loop, this is another one. This loop that's in the perimeter, the periphery of the building, the very outside edge of the building, these systems are typically put in concrete slabs, concrete slab on grade house. And this will be a little cheese box house, I call them. Uh, we have a 10 gug in New Jersey, uh, uh, one two-bedroom uh, retirement houses. Crestwood Village, there's 10 or 12,000 of these houses in there. And they all look the same. And, you know, it's a nice little place for mom and pop to retire. And, you know, they only need two bedrooms. They got their own, and then they have a guest room that... You, they use when the kids come to visit or whatever. But the, this house is put in a nice community where they're protected and they have common interest with other people their age. And, you know, it's usually in a nice climate and, you know, it, it, it has value. But this perimeter loop is one size. It doesn't change. The furnace is usually a counterflow that's put in a hallway uh, utility room. You know, the, you'll have the utility right, room right here. This is the hallway. You'll have a return grill high in the hallway. Uh, you'll have the kitchen back here, dining room, bathroom, bedroom, 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 that kind of thing, or bedroom, bedroom, depending on what they did. The counterflow will feed this loop at different points so that the pressure in this outer perimeter loop is equal at all points. And these are great systems. They write books about designing perimeter loop systems. They deliver great heating and air conditioning. The flow, the pressure is really beautiful at all points. But, you know, it has a way of being designed that's proper and a way that's not proper. So you want to do it, you got to learn how to do it. Midwest a lot. Uh, even, you know, certain developments will, will adopt this kind of thing if it suits their needs, if they're using slabs. This, on the other hand, is what we call a reducing trunk duct system. And the reason is, every time you take a branch off, the trunk reduces. So, you're again, you're maintaining perfect pressures. These were, because uh, every time a branch line comes off, the trunk gets smaller and therefore maintains the pressure. Remember, the reason you make reductions in anything is to improve pressure that was prior to that transition dropping off like putting your thumb over the end of a hose. You increase the pressure behind the thumb and after the thumb, and you increase flow as a result of that. But these were very popular right after World War II. If you came out of World War II in 45, 47, sometime around there, then you wanted to be a tin knocker. You went to work. This is what you learned to make. Didn't even have round takeoffs at that time. They were round branch lines. Everything was rectangular. If this went up in a wall, it became what they called wall stack. It was two and a quarter inches deep, front to back, and had the width anywhere from 8, 10 to 12 inches, sometimes as wide as 14 inches, which would fit exactly in a stud space that was 16 inches on center. Radial systems. This is 
what you call the octopus or whatever, where you throw an air handler up in the attic and you just run flex lines or whatever, radial lines in different directions. This is the same thing, except that typically these end up being three-inch round ducts. These are the kind of uh, systems you put in houses that aren't used year-round for comfort. Jersey Shore, also right after World War II, all the GIs came home, married their you know, high school sweetheart and started a family. If you could afford it, you bought or rented a little shack down the beach, a little two-bedroom thing with a big living room, combination eating kitchen. And uh, you spent the summers there in the Jersey Shore. That's the way it was done. People from Philadelphia to factories and North Jersey and New York would flock to the Jersey Shore. Airline travel wasn't popular at all back then. So you could go as far as your gas tank could take you. And in the case of the Northeast, that was New Jersey, the shoreline. And you will find in Jersey, if you go in these little houses of line the Jersey Shore, you will find a little tiny furnace with three-inch round ducts that just run along the ceiling exposed that dump air into the rooms simply to keep it from freezing in the wintertime when this house is not occupied. The problem is some of those houses are occupied year-round, and I can't tell you with a system like this how uncomfortable the occupants are. So those are the primary types of duct systems you need to be aware of. Study how they're made and what they're called. Magnahelic. Magnahelic is a diaphragm type. There's a diaphragm in here. This is a magnahelic gauge. That's the front of it. This is a cross-sectional view of it. A diaphragm type differential pressure gauge. You have a high side connects to one side of the diaphragm, a low side port that connects to the other side, and the needle that moves is connected right here directly to that diaphragm. So when the pressure on this side is greater than the pressure on that side, it causes the needle move in one direction. When you have the opposite situation, the needle moves in the other direction. Magnahelic readings, readings like this, are differential in that you're using both probes. You put a probe here from the magnahelic, you take the other probe and put it over here, and you can read a differential pressure from this point to this point, or they're relative to atmosphere. These two readings you're looking at here are relative to atmosphere because you've taken one of the probes, the high probe here, and the low probe is reading atmospheric pressure. So the pressure you're going to read on this gauge is relative to the atmosphere. And here you're doing the same thing. You take the low side probe, the one that's on the other side of the diaphragm, and you expose it to a negative pressure, a pressure less than atmosphere that's created by the movement of the blower. And the other probe, the high-pressure probe, is in the atmosphere. So the reading you're going to get is going to be relative to the atmosphere. So it's either differential, where you've hooked up two hoses and you're reading across something, or it's relative to atmosphere, where you're only using one hose. Understand, while we're looking at this type of blower, as the static pressure increases on the blower, the amp draw is going to decrease. All right. This is true for a PSC motor, not for a variable speed motor. So when you're taking this exam, to my knowledge, there are no questions on that exam relative to variable speed air handlers or blowers. You, Any question they ask you where they don't specify otherwise, assume they're talking about a PSC motor, a constant airflow motor. Okay, not a constant volume, not a constant torque, a constant airflow blower, whose static pressure is going to cause a variation in the amp draw and in the airflow. Now, what's wrong in this situation? The, I'm talking about the magnahelix here. If you put a probe under this coil and it reads 3.5, is that high or low? If you put the probe here behind this air cleaner and it reads 6.0, is that high or low? Well, this is probably a good reading. Remember the pressure drop across the coil was like 2.0 when it was dry? So if, if this is a dry coil, I mean, there's a lot of questions to be answered here, but if this is a dry coil and it has a normal pressure drop of about 0.20, well, that would leave 1.5 for the duct system, and that ain't bad. That, that, that's a very good number. However, if this pro, uh, probe were placed here 
it wouldn't be able to see all this resistance behind it. And if you had that reading in this position, then that's extremely high. 6.0 here, I don't like it no matter what. The pressure drop over this air cleaner, if it's media or electronic, is at least 0 0.20 when it's clean. But 6.0, that means that the resistance in the duct system is 0.4 or higher. In fact, if this probe were moved here or up here and had that reading, uh, you probably wouldn't have a heat exchanger left. And any time the air conditioning came on, you'd ice the coil. The airflow would be so low. That pressure is so high that the airflow is diminished dramatically. All right. Fire codes. Let's talk about fire codes. Well, fire dampers. Here's a fire damper. What holds this accordion up that's going to flop down in the case of a fire is a fusible link. There's a couple different temperatures. I think 190 degrees and 210 or 160 and 210. I honestly forget, but that's academic. What happens when that fuse melts, the gate, the, the strap that's holding it up opens up and the gate falls down and blocks airflow through the duct. Now the NFPA, the fire code, NFPA 54 says that uh, requires that fire dampers be installed in all ducts that pass through a fire rated wall or partition if e in either a residential or commercial application. Now this is a horizontal duct. They make vertical types that have springs on them that close. All right, but the weight of this gate that's going to fall down is enough to close the gate and stop the airflow. Because if you have that high of a temperature in this duct, you're probably transferring the fire to another point in the system using the blower. So shut down the duct. Don't transfer the heat. Don't keep adding oxygen to a fire and all the other things that are associated with moving air. The NFPA, National Fire Prevention Act, also, administration, also regulates all duct-mounted devices, like smoke detectors and that kind of thing. I thank you for your time and attention. Let's take a look at some Q&A, because this is all about Q&A. This is what we're preparing you for. So the first thing I'm going to ask you is, on the maintenance call for an 80,000 BTU output furnace, you find that a supply temperature is 100 degrees Fahrenheit. The returned air temperature at the furnace is 65 degrees. What is the volume of air at the bonnet in the furnace, at the very top, the outlet of the furnace? Uh, how many CFM? 2468, 2286, 2116, 1947 was the year I was born, by the way. So that's got to be the answer. How much air? Well, employ the sensible heat formula. The CFM is going to be equal to the sensible BTU output divided by 1.08 times the temperature difference. They told us the output of this furnace up here was 80,000. They said they had 100 degree supply temperature, 65 degree return. Subtract them, multiply by 1.08, 2116. 2,116 CFM of air are leaving the bond of that furnace when you have these conditions. Two, the sensible heat equation from the question number one above is not applicable to which of the following scenarios. Which of the following scenarios can you not use that sensible heat equation? A gas or oil furnace, does it apply there? A vapor compression cooling system? You know, regular split system air conditioning, R22, 410A, that's vapor compression. The compressor compresses vapor. C, an air-to-air -air heat pump. D, both B and C. What's the correct answer here? Yeah, man. Vapor compression, anything it uses a compressor, you, you know, you cannot apply that formula because you can't separate sensible from latent. Three, an air-to-air -air heat pump is operating in the emergency heat mode and has a supply temperature of 90 degrees, a return temperature of 60 degrees Fahrenheit, and an airflow of 850 CFM. What is the heating BTU output of that furnace in the emergency heat mode? 
23,611, 25, 5, 5, 54, or 34,130 BTUs. What is it? Employ the formula. The BTUs are going to be equal to the CFM times the temperature difference times 1.08. You said the CFM was 850. There was a 90-60 split on a temperature difference. Multiply that by 1.08, 27,540. Four. What is the acceptable range of velocities in a residential trunk duct? Residential trunk duct. What's the acceptable range of velocities? 2 to 400 feet a minute, 4 to 6, 7 to 9, 9 to 1,200 feet a minute. What's acceptable? C, 7 to 9. 700 to 900 feet a minute. Less than this, you're going to have trouble penetrating the room with air and filling the branch ducts because this approaches branch duct velocity. 900 feet a minute above that, when you get up around 1,000, you're going to have noise, I guarantee it. Five, total pressure in a ducted distribution system is, total pressure is static plus velocity, static minus velocity, static divided by velocity, static times multiplied by velocity pressure. Which is it? What is total pressure? Yeah, man, static plus velocity. And ignore the signs. You're, you're, you know, positive and negative. Add everything up. Six, according to fan laws, what happens to the RPM if the CFM is doubled? It halves, it doubles, it squares, it cubes. What happens to the RPM if you double the CFM? It's going to double. There's a direct relationship. You double the RPM, you double the CFM. Double the CFM, double the RPM. Seven, providing you have the horsepower to do it. According to the fan laws, what happens to the static pressure if the RPM is double? It halves, doubles, squares, cubes. What happens to the static pressure? Static is going to square. How can you speed up, double the speed of a blower, and not square the static pressure in that duct. Now the blower has to overcome that pressure. Can't speed up air. Drive down the highway 25 miles an hour. Stick your head out the window. You're seeing velocity pressure at 25 miles an hour. Now put your foot in the carburetor. Get the car up to 80 miles an hour. What happened to the pressure you're feeling in your face? It, it squared. Okay? it more than squared. It would have squared if you went from 25 to 50 miles an hour. 8. What type of centrifugal blower is most commonly used in residential and light commercial HVAC work? Axial? Radial? Backward curved? Forward curved? What do we most commonly see? You bet you. 9. The result of continued operation of a damaged squirrel cage blower wheel on a direct drive blower is, what's the result of that? Vibration and noise, improper airflow, damage to the motor, all of the above. Yeah, that, that's a gimme, and we just talked about that, so that, that's not too hard. Ten, what is the difference between a register and a grill? A grill has a damper and a register does not. A register has a damper and a grill does not. Registers are installed in sidewalls and grills are installed in ceilings only. Or D, there is no difference or interchangeable. What's the answer here? Yeah, man. Register has a damper, a grill does not. 11. The face velocity of a residential return grill should be limited to a residential return grill should be limited to 200 feet a minute, 300, 400, 500. What, what should we limit the velocity to? Yeah, man, 400 feet a minute. It goes faster than that? No, right here you're going to start to get, you're going to start to hear, and the faster you go, 700, 800, you're not going to be able to hear the television. 12, a feeling of 
Drafty air during the heating season can be caused by excess velocity, excess volume, CFM, excess pressure, excess sensitivity of the person. Yeah. You you could argue a couple of these things, but the the clear unequivocal best answer here is velocity will always cause that in spite of pressure, volume, or even personal sensitivity. I don't care how sensitive or insensitive you are, I can increase the velocity to the point where you're going to feel it. 13. What is the recommended range of face velocities for a sidewall supply register? 400 to 600 feet a minute, 5 to 7, 7 to 9, 9 to 1100 feet per minute. What's acceptable for a register? Five to seven. That's what you're looking for. That's the face velocity. Keep four to six hundred feet in the trunk, and your your face velocity shouldn't exceed that. Fourteen flexible ducts, eight inches or less in diameter, should be supported every three feet, four feet, five feet, six feet. How often do you have to support eight inch or less flexible duct? Yeah, every five feet. The minimum width of a flexible duct hanger or strap is one inch, inch and a half, two uh, inch and three quarter, two inch. What is it? What's the minimum width? Inch and a half. Sixteen. An undersized duct system can result in undersized ducts. They're too small. Inadequate airflow. High external static pressure, noisy operation, all of the above. What do you think? Again, that should be a gimme. You're going to get all three, whether you want it or not. Make the ducts too small, and that's what you're going to get. And the smaller the ducts are relative to what they should be, the worse each of these will be. When we've got more noise, you'll have higher pressure, you'll have less and less airflow. You make the duct small enough, make it the size of a straw, and you're virtually not going to have any airflow. 17. An insulation collar properly installed in a supply duct will, an isolation collar, will what? Reduce vibration and noise transmission, act as a fire stop, isolate branch runouts from trunk runs, or transmit vibration to the structure. What will that isolation collar do? Hopefully, reduce vibration and noise transmission. That's its job. 18. Ductwork installed in an unconditioned space should be insulated, covered with a vapor barrier, both A and B. Neither A nor B are required. Yeah, man. But you know what? Some codes don't specify that. None of the national codes, they all specify that. But local codes, you know, when, when you don't have national precedent, that kind of thing, they don't necessarily require it. A lot of codes, uh, uh, building inspe uh, inspectors, local, uh, you know, uh, mechanical code inspectors in different towns, they'll allow you to pan ducks for returns. And to me, that's a, a ludicrous way to attempt to bring air back. But they allow it. So you could, you could argue this, but clearly, you know, insulate them. They're in unconditioned areas. Insulate them, cover them with a vapor barrier. If you don't, you're going to gain or lose moisture through it, and you're going to gain or lose heat as a result of lost insulation or lack of insulation. 19, why would you cross-break a sheet metal trunk duct? Why would you cross-break it? To increase airflow and reduce static pressure to improve strength and rigidity and reduce vibration, to reduce noise transmission to the structure, to improve velocity and increase static pressure. Well, why do you cross-break metal? Yeah, to improve strength and rigidity and reduce vibration. Now, it's true when you reduce vibration, you do transfer less noise to the structure. But breaking the duct is the important thing. The, the, I'm sorry, the important reason why you do it is for strength and rigidity. Uh, this is a secondary concern. And these are the way you're going to get questions. So, again, find the one that's most important.
I know this is also true, but this is a whole lot more what I'm going to call again unequivocal. You can't argue this. This you can argue and say, well, you know, if you don't cross break the, the duck, it's going to wobble and all that, and transmission of noise is not going to be an issue. You're going to you're going to rattle the blower apart. That's more important. Twenty. Uncontrolled outside air that leaks into a building is called infiltration, ventilation, exfiltration, any of the above. Uncontrolled outside air. Yeah, man, infiltration. If all the ductwork is located in an unconditioned, vented attic, and there is a significant leak in the return side of the system, this can cause reduced infiltration, a positive pressure in the conditioned space, complaints of damp air, all of the above. What do you think? We got ductwork located in an unvented attic. I'm sorry, a, a vented attic, and it's got a leak in a significant leak in the return. What's going to happen? Every, all this is going to happen. You're going to have a positive pressure in the building. That's going to create a reduction in a dramatic reduction in infiltration, and the positive pressure will. And you're going to have complaints of damp air because you're sucking in moisture. And of course, that's not true in Tucson, Arizona, where it's so dry, they'd be happy with a little moisture in the air. But nine out of nine places, that's what's going to happen. 22. On a design condition day, 95% outside, 75% inside, a 15% leak rate in the return duct located in a vented attic will create a positive pressure in the structure and reduce overall cooling requirements not be an issue as long as the ducts are properly insulated, cause a capacity loss of 50% or more, or create a minimum acceptable leak rate and will not cause a significant problem. So what we're saying here is that's, that's normal. All right, so what's the answer? What do you think? Yeah, man, see, absolutely. 50% or more reduction in capacity, 15% leak rate in a return duct. 23. A three-ton blower is a three-ton blower at high speed against approximately half an inch water column external static pressure. Whenever it says so on the nameplate or product literature, whenever all components match Condenser, evaporator, blower, all three ton. Is that when it's a three ton blower? Or it's true all the time? Yeah, man. High speed, half inch static. 99.999% of the blowers you'll ever run into are rated that way. 24. A ducted distribution system characterized by one or more non reducing trunk ducts. With multiple branches off of each of the properly, each is properly referred to as, okay, what kind of duct system is this? Forget the fact that I can't read. Non-reducing trunk with multiple branches. What do you think it is? Flexible duct system? An extended plenum duct system? Perimeter loop duct system? Radial duct system? Of this, these descriptions, of these categories, what has been described here? What's the best description for that? Yeah, extended plenum, without a doubt. It. Could it be a flexible duct? Sure it could. Because I said it was a non-reducing trunk. I, I didn't say that it, what it was made out of. But flex, that could be flexible duct. Certainly could be. But multiple branches. Okay, uh, it really, this is by far the, mo the more acceptable, more characterized by that type of non-reducing trunk duct. Again, choose the best answer. All right. I, I know I'm making this a little vague, but trust me, I'm doing this on purpose. I'm, I'm trying to create doubt in your brain. That's all I'm trying to do. A ducted distribution system characterized by one continuous non-reducing loop at the periphery of the building that is fed by multiple ducts from a central air handler is properly known as flexible duct, extended plenum duct, 
system, a perimeter loop duct system, a radial duct system. Which one do you think? Non-reducing loop at the periphery, the edge of the building. Yeah, man, perimeter loop, clearly, unequivocally. Could that be made out of flexible duct and still be good? Sure it could. But you probably wouldn't call it a perimeter loop system. You'd call it a flexible duct system that was arranged in a perimeter loop fashion. All right, you get what I'm saying here? 26. A diaphragm type differential pressure device can read pressures that are relative to atmosphere, that are differential, both A, uh, both, I'm sorry, both, it should have said A and B above. Sorry, that's a typo. D, neither A nor B above. What do you think? Yeah, both. Both A and B above is the correct answer. Both A and B above are correct. All right, sorry for that typo. We, we are real here. I could back all this up and take 20 minutes and straighten it out, and we would lose continuity. So let's stay with the program and make the best out of a bad situation. All right? And if that brings tears to your eyes, then, I don't know, you're in the wrong business. NFPA. The fire code 54 requires that dampers be installed in all fire rated walls in a residence, all fire rated walls in a commercial building, all interior walls that ducts penetrate, both A and B above. What do you think? Where, where does the NFPA 54 require fire dampers? Yeah, A and B, all fire rated walls in a residence or commercial building. You know where the fire rated wall is? If you have a condo and you have condo A, condo B, condo C side by side, and you have like a, I don't know, an exhaust fan or a ventilation duct or something like that that goes from condo A to condo B to condo C, the firewall between condo A and condo B, if that's penetrated by that duct, you need a uh, fire damper in there. The same thing. Commercial buildings. Twenty-eight. What is the re regulatory authority for duck-mounted safety devices? NFPA, OSHA, UL, NSPC. What is it? Who has authority over smoke detectors? Any any kind of fire dampers, uh, fire sensors? Uh, in duct systems, heat sensors, who has authority over that? The National Fire Protection uh, Agency, all right? Uh, NSPC, for your information, is the National Standard Plumbing Code, so I'm, I'm glad you didn't pick that. 29. If you read 230 volts across an electric heating element and also read zero amps, what's the problem? You know, you read at the element, you read 230, and no amp draw. The element's shorted. The element's open. The high limit control is open. The W2 circuit is not made. What do you think's wrong here? Did I give you enough information? I really did. Okay? You got an element that's open. You read 230 volts at the element. It can't be shorted. All right? You wouldn't have read 230 volts. The high limit control, whether it's open, it has to be closed, or you wouldn't have had 230 volts at the limit. And the W2 circuit, if this is part of the W2 circuit, has to be made, or you wouldn't have power down at the element itself. So you've got to have an open element. You have voltage at, the, the, let's say, this side of the element, goes through the element, there's an open here, and you have the other side of power at this point. The element is definitely open. 30. What happens to airflow, CFM, when the return static pressure is increased by a dirty filter? What happens to the airflow? Nothing. It's increased. It's decreased. The increase in static pressure will convert to velocity pressure. Which of these do you think is correct? Yeah, you're going to decrease. Absolutely decrease. When the, when the return static pressure is increased, you cause extra resistance for the blower to overcome. You're going to have less airflow. 
hopefully we'll see you on part three.